contentious issue in American life, then surely education comes a close second, and often they're really inseparable. Minorities demand not just equal opportunity to go to college, but special opportunity, and to varying degrees, the government has supported that demand. It's an old story, but what happens when the majority is the minority and vice versa? As we reported last September, you can find out if you spend a little time at Alabama State University in Montgomery. A hundred years ago, it was called the State Normal School for Colored Students. In the days of segregation, it kept black students in their place by providing only a limited education. Graduation Day 1999. Today's graduates receive diplomas in wide-ranging fields of study. Tarakesha DuBose. But this look of Alabama State had to change. Andre McMillan. ASU was ordered by law to recruit minorities. Rosemary Heath. These are the minorities. Douglas Kirk. In 1995, a federal judge ordered the state of Alabama to pay a million dollars a year for 10 years to fund scholarships just for white students. Most are getting an absolutely free education. Although there are black scholarships as well, some students like Rhonda Turner, Mark Harris, and Corey Muhammad find the subsidizing of whites offensive. At white universities, their reasons for providing minority scholarships are because of the past injustices and because of the racial environment at that university. Um, ASU has never discriminated against whites. We, it was never a situation to where um, blacks didn't want whites to go to school with them. Whites didn't want to come to school with blacks. We will accept whoever wants to come here. They want to stay out there, then they're going to stay out there. Come in if you want. The door is open. But it took more than a push to get whites to walk in. It took cash. The judge appointed attorney Carlos Gonzalez to see to it that his order was carried out. Do you think the existing system is fair? Fair to black uh, students, to African American students? Uh, I think it is fair when put into the larger context of what the court is trying to achieve, yes sir. What the court was trying to achieve was the dismantling of Alabama's separate but unequal educational system. The chapter starts on page 431. Ready? to make ASU academically competitive and attractive to students of all races. That's what makes it so difficult. The judge ordered the state to provide more than $100 million for advanced courses, new classrooms, increased faculty. He added an extra $10 million to help ASU recruit more whites. Now, more than 500 whites are enrolled about 10% of the student population, and about 80% of them are on scholarships. Uh, it was critical uh, that the desegregation effort begin in earnest rapidly. That's what these scholarships are for. The overall objective here is to increase the opportunity for all students. Uh, it is difficult, I admit it, for some students to, uh, to accept it. It was more than just the white-only scholarships that upset black students. What truly galled them was one of the judge's key rationales for ordering them. He said that increasing the number of whites would eliminate the perception among whites that ASU provides an inferior education. We don't need white students to come and that's the stamp of approval of, of a valid school. He was quick to say that that wasn't his view, but he was trying to counteract the general view. That, oh, right. What do you think of that? I think that's awful. So saying that we need white students here in order to eliminate perceptions of inferiority as if they're going to go back home and tell their parents and other, um, other members of their community that, hey, this is a good school. We don't need that. We don't need white students here in order to say that we are a qualified school. But the law says you do need them. According to Jim Smithson, ASU's minority recruiter. You at our university would be a minority. You're aware of that. The realities of race in Alabama present real barriers to getting whites to come to the school. The traditional population is African American. You and I are the minorities, okay? He pitches ASU to high school students across Alabama. We received uh, an invitation to go to a school in North Alabama. This was a all-white school. The first young lady I was speaking with, uh, she was informed that we were a traditional black university. Uh, she asked positive questions, and then mom came out of nowhere screaming, 
Jane Doe, get away from that table. That's an in school. That's a black school. That's she, used than, the, oh, yeah. she used the N word and she said it as loud as she could so that anybody could hear her. And that really made me feel about that small. And however, I mean, I just said, here is our brochures. Thank you for stopping by. And this is your scholarship form, okay? But even the offer of scholarships worth anywhere from ten to thirty thousand dollars over four years wasn't enough. Here's your scholarship form. Recruiting whites was so difficult, ASU made them an even better offer. While a black student needed a 3.0 grade point average, a B to get a full tuition scholarship, a white needed only a C, a 2.0. That's nothing. You could have slept through high school and got a 2.0. But even good grades didn't guarantee a black student a scholarship. I came here with a 3.5 grade point average, but I didn't get a scholarship, and I was upset. I found out the qualifications for white students to get a scholarship, 2.0, and things of that nature. It just didn't look right to me. For the past four years, the state of Alabama has paid every penny of Richard Livingston's tuition. What were your grades like? What were your grades like when you were here? Uh. I transferred from Indiana State with a 2.58 GPA. Is that a C? Mid-C range. From what you know, are they, uh, are they pretty smart? They do the work? Capable of doing the work? Those that I know, yeah. But I'm there sorry. has been those that weren't capable of doing the work. A couple that I've seen that were real lazy and shiftless. So you're going to have all kinds, especially with those low standards. Even whites who came in with top grades like Karen Heiss, Chris Robinson, and Rosie Heiss, all of whom got free tuition, room, board, and books, learned what it was like to be stereotyped because of skin color. Someone was quoted in the newspaper as saying, all of the, peop all of the white people here are really just white trash. And when I read it, it really made me angry. People may from afar look at the white students and say, oh, well, they, don't, they didn't have the grades to get in or, or they're just here because they're on a white scholarship. But once you're actually in class with people and you measure up, they realize that you're not the idiot from off the street that decided to come to ASU. When they all started at ASU in 1995, the school was still almost 95% black. I was about to say, university... Being the minority took a little getting used to. Being the minority, it is like, wow, everybody's, I stand out everywhere I go. There's nothing that I can do to blend in. When I first got here, you know, I'm looking around thinking, wow, I'm the only white person in a lot of situations. And then you know what it feels like for people not to talk to you because you're a certain color or people to look at you and think a certain thing immediately. Why did you want to come here? Because it was paid for. Do you think, any of you think it's unfair? Yeah, I do. Very. I think that it's definitely unfair that we're here based on the fact that we're white um, and we're given money to be here because we're white. However, I wasn't going to pass up the chance to have a free education. I'm, I'm not stupid. I'm just, I just don't think it's fair. The university did eliminate some of the unfairness when it announced that starting with 1999 freshmen, the scholarship requirements are the same for everyone. But that's not good enough for Jesse Tompkins, a graduate student who says that any scholarship program that excludes blacks is still flat out wrong. Here in Alabama, we have a program that is designed to discriminate and is state supported. And that, says Tompkins, is a violation of his constitutional rights and he's brought in a white conservative lawyer to sue the university. Jesse had a right to compete for that scholarship on the same terms as any other student without taking the color of his skin into consideration. The lawyer, Terry Pell, a former official of the Reagan administration, is senior counsel for the Center for Individual Rights, the CIR, a conservative foundation. The only way to put race behind us is in fact to put race behind us. If you think the president of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, Elaine Jones, would agree with that statement, you'd be wrong. I believe that the Center for Individual Rights has an agenda that is going to move us back toward 
uh, separate and unequal. All of the center's previous challenges of racial preferences at colleges have been on behalf of white students who say minorities should not get special treatment. Are you uh, surprised that the CIR took the case? Oh, no, Marlon. I'm not surprised. I mean, the CIR has been on a tear to undercut all of the progress that we as a nation have made on the issues of race. Do you suggest that Jesse has a, a, a hidden agenda in all this? Oh, no. All I, on this one, I'm saying that Jesse is being used. There are some who are saying you're simply being used by a conservative legal foundation that wants to get rid of affirmative action and that they're trying to put a black face on no, this no, no, I, you, action. That's outrageous. I am the one that went to CR in order to get help because no other group would help me. The NAACP said, no, we can't help. And wouldn't help. If the center is successful in eliminating this scholarship program, what it means is that scholarship programs across the country and other initiatives that encourage African-American and brown students to go to school will be eliminated. It'll go beyond scholarships. It'll be, it'll be admissions in a race-conscious effort. I think it's the height of hypocrisy to start questioning our motives when these traditional civil rights organizations were unwilling to represent Jesse in a case challenging a racial preference which clearly harms blacks. In the eyes of many whites who would come to Alabama State University, they will not come because they perceive it as being uh, of uh, an inferior education. That, that's the perception. And the court is trying to overcome that perception by saying, let's make the scholarships, limited amount of scholarships available so that they can come, get the education and see for themselves. Let's move toward, in Alabama, an integrated higher education setting. But what happens in five years when the whites-only scholarship program ends? After these scholarships run out, I don't believe that it's going to be any more diversified than it was before it started. Because the major incentive to come is still the money. Of course. Do you think that whites will continue to go, pay tuition, do all the things ordinary students do? Uh, or once the money disappears, the whites will disappear? Well, by that time, Alabama State University will have white alumni who will be inclined to encourage their associates, friends, children, and others in the future to attend Alabama State University. When I came in, I felt like, well, this is their school, and, and, and I don't want it to be an us and them thing because I don't feel that way at all. But that's kind of, I was like, well, I'm the oddball here. But now I feel like, well, this is my school, mm -hmm. you know, and it's been my school for four years. And this is going to be my alma mater, and I'm going to be an alumni, uh, and I'm going to love it, you know, and that's just how it is. Bob Fall looks at the pros and cons of affirmative action. Hi, everybody. Hello. How are you doing? This is the way affirmative action is supposed to look. 43-year-old Mignon Williams, recruited and promoted by the Xerox Corporation, largely because she is black and female. If I was to look back 20 years ago, never would have thought that today I'd be sitting here in a highly competitive role as Vice President National Sales Manager. Affirmative action has been good for black America because it's enabled millions of black people to rise from obscurity, poverty, toil of the long day's road into decent jobs. But down corporate corridors and on college campuses, all that good has come with a very high price tag. Listen to this affirmative action baby at the University of Michigan. I had a student very vocal with me and told me uh, that I didn't belong here because I, w I was only here because I was black and I was not qualified. Devlin Ponte says he has felt the backlash. Students who benefit from affirmative action made to feel unwelcome and unworthy. There have been instances where there has been graffiti written on the wall, um, on the elevators, um, using words as niggers, go home, you know, you don't belong here, anti-affirmative um, action type of articles uh, pasted up on walls. They are not yet freed from the bonds of injustice. 30 years ago, President Kennedy ordered contractors doing business with the federal government to hire minorities, affirmative action to promote equal opportunity. Since then, embittered whites who feel they've been pushed aside or passed over 
have condemned the preferential treatment as unfair, un-American. Now there's a new group that's getting trampled, and it's us, and we don't like it anymore. Political campaigns have even been won largely by appealing to that sense of outrage. You needed that job, and you were the best qualified. But they had to give it to a minority because of a racial quota. Is that really fair? What is new now is that the criticism of affirmative action is coming not from disgruntled whites, but from people like Clarence Thomas and other black conservatives who argue that it makes blacks rely too much on handouts, too little on self-reliance. It's caused us, I think, to become dependent on the notion that our only power comes from the redress we can get from American society, from government. And, says Steele, it hasn't worked. Despite affirmative action, black college students graduated about half the rate of whites. More black men are in prison or on parole than in college classrooms. What affirmative action really does, says Steele, is tell blacks you're inferior. Every single black who's hired, every black in America, lives with the stigma today. Look how, look how fascinating this is. We've turned around and created a new system to stigmatize a race with inferiority that has suffered from the stigma of inferiority for 350 years. So it's backfired. It's backfired. I almost cry with pity or with rage when I read those statements from black conservatives because every one of them is the beneficiary of affirmative action. It's selfish, short-sighted, stupid, narrow, regressive. It looks as if they're saying, I climbed up the steps of affirmative action, but now since I've got my perch with the other folk, I'm going to cut the ladder off so nobody else can get up here. I'm doing just fine. Minion Williams and others now climbing that ladder thanks to affirmative action say they have to work twice as hard now to prove they belong. What they're also finding is that affirmative action can help only so much. You can take that affirmative action tag off of you any time, but you can keep your, you keep your black skin and you keep that, black, that, that, that stigma of being black in America. I think so the affirmative action debate reaches well beyond the Thomas confirmation hearings. What, it asks, is the real cost of helping some people get a foot in the door? Bob Fall, CBS News, Ann Arbor, Michigan. We want our school back. This is all we want. We want peace, we want quietness, but we want our school. Why can't the federal government leave us alone and give us our school for the sake of our children, for us, for peace of mind? We want no trouble. We don't condemn these black people. They are human beings, too. We understand that, but we want our school, and we're going to get it if we have to go to Washington to get it. And this isn't over yet, and it won't be over until our children are taken out of this school and placed in their neighborhood school. What's so bad about that? We aren't standing here to create a problem. We are doing what they have done many, many times. Now, is that wrong, people of this world today? Is it wrong that we stand up for a change? For the first time, we are standing up for our rights. What is wrong about that? And why did he have to come over here to order us to do what they want us to do? Now, we're not going to do it. That is over. Amen. These Amen. people fight for your rights. And I mean fight for what you think is right and what's in here to fight for. You got a heart, you got a conscience. Fight for it. And give it all you got. And I mean the people of the world today better do it. Because if they don't, they're going to be dominated throughout this world by this federal government which is dominating the world today. No matter who you are, black or white, if you feel that it's right, fight for it. But fight for the right thing. Don't create a disturbance, but fight for what you got and for what you worked hard for. In my opinion, if anybody has the right to fight, it's the Indians. They were the ones that were here in this country before the black people or before we were. And if they, anybody has a right to fight, they have a right to fight for it. Why should we have to uh, be bust from one end of town to the other. And what's so bad about it is the fact that many children of today are going to drop out of this school and be without an education because of this dumb foolishness. It's dumb. There's no sense in it. 
And we the people of this Augusta, Georgia.